Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. Andrew, when did you first become interested in aviation? Uh, I don't actually remember, Mike. I think it was in the pushchair. My um, my mum was uh, said I'd point up at the sky and say sky. So I think it, it started way before I was even aware of it starting. But then it you know it just developed as it does. You know building model aeroplanes, building airfix kits, all that sort of stuff. Getting in the air cadets, flying in the back of a chipmunk <laughs> with a parachute below your bum, walking around looking like you had some sort of accident. But uh, yeah, it was it was it was ever since I can remember. So why did you join the Royal Navy rather than the RAF? It's, uh, it's a good question, <laughs> if you want the honest answer. So I did a Royal Air Force Flying Scholarship when I was only 16 years old and got my private pilot's license at just 17 years old and then um, applied to the Air Force and didn't get in. Um, so, and I tried again after university and didn't get in. I wasn't successful in my application. So um, I think if I'd have been successful, I would have been in the Royal Air Force and much to the amusement of all my Air Force colleagues now, of course. But um, yeah, that, that was the main reason really, Mike. Just um, unfortunately didn't make the grade when it came to OESC. <laughs> So can you tell us some of the aircraft you started training on? Um, so right back on the sort of Air Force Flying Scholarship, this is before my military days, that was a PA-38 Tomahawk. Uh, did a bit of bulldog flying when I was in the University Air Squadron, so that was really, really cool. Um, and then uh, having been successful with joining the Royal Navy, so I must have had something they liked, um, I started off on the Firefly T-67M, uh, which was a really cool aeroplane, 260 horsepower, lovely aircraft to fly, and, um, and then moved from the Firefly to the to Carno, which is of course being replaced by the Texan now, then to the Hawk T Mark 1, and then onwards to the OCU. Did you mix with any uh, RAF officers going through this training period? Oh, unfortunately, yes. No. <laughs> Banter aside, some of my best mates are from the Air Force. And um, in fact, when I started elementary flying training at that stage, the Royal Navy and the Army and the Royal Air Force it was like a tri service um, training uh, establishment at uh, RAF Cranwell. So some of my mates, like Mike Ling, who everyone knows, I'm sure, uh, started out with me, and uh, guys like Dave Davis, all Red Arrows pilots. So, uh, and then, of course, as a fast jet pilot, I was then trained predominantly until I hit the OCU with Royal Air Force pilots. So at RAF Linston on Easel and Takano and then moving to RAF Valley on the Hawk, all of that training was completed with the majority of the student pilots being Royal Air Force pilots. So, yeah. so what did the Navy do different from the RAF or was it basically the same training going through this period? Uh, they chopped a lot more people <laughs> because of course as a uh, Royal Navy fast jet pilot uh, or wannabe fast jet pilot there was only one aircraft to fly at that stage which was the Sea Harrier um, and of course if you didn't make the grade to be a single seat fast jet pilot then there was nowhere else for you to, to go so that was one of the uh, that was one of the main main differences. We did have some extra training in fact after after officer training, Royal Navy pilots went to what they called grading flight and did about 10 hours flying in a Grob uh, 115, I think it was. Uh, and that was just to see if you've got even a raw aptitude to start elementary flying training. And then I think uh, the only extra sort of difference was an extra flight at RAF Valley. For some reason, a historical reason, um, the Royal Navy pilots got one extra flight to go and do what they wanted. Um, so yeah, that, that, but predominantly the training was very, very similar. So how long did your training last before you got posted to your frontline aircraft? Um, so I was in the days where there were still holdovers, but not as significant as they are now. Um, but the, the training time took approximately five years. And if you compare that to you know, sort of airline training where you could do it in 18 months, it's a pretty long training process. But yeah, approximately five years. What were your first thoughts of the Hawk? I was, oh, I was lucky enough to fly the Hawk on uh, holdover, so waiting for the rest of my flying train to start. And um, actually, <laughs> weirdly if you guess, initially I was a bit disappointed because I expected the first time I flew in a fast jet I was going to have a real kick in the back Top Gun style, mm -hmm. you know, be propelled off the runway. But of course the Hawk's not got a massive engine and it's not got reheat, mm -hmm. so that didn't happen. But once we were airborne, I um, absolutely loved it, Mike. It's just, uh, I mean, I wasn't handling it at that time. It was an instructor of mine, um, Jack London from the Royal Navy, and we were flying in formation 
formation with a, a guy that was converting from being helicopters to fast jet. And I just remember flying formation and at that stage then it sort of kicks you like I'm in a fast jet, this aircraft feels amazing. So yeah, um, great. So what was the role of the Hawk or is the role of the Hawk? Uh, for, so currently for the Royal Navy, it's uh, in, in support essentially of uh, the Royal Navy doing things like ship attack, so acting as if they're sort of either aircraft or simulated missiles. I know they do some work as well on exercise in, in conjunction with the Royal Air Force, so they essentially act in support to play a role, simulate a sort of role of either an aircraft or a missile in flight to attack other aircraft or ships. So can you talk us through some of your ground training? Yeah, the ground training, no pilot likes ground training, Mike. So uh, from my perspective, I've sort of erased most of those ground training memories from my mind. Uh, I do have vague recollections of ground training, but it's, it's, it's sort of evaporated, if <laughs> I'm honest with you. Can you remember your first flight in the Hawk? Um, I can. My, my first sort of seat in, a, in a front of a, of a Hawk was at RAF Valley, going through advanced uh, flying training after leaving Linton on Ouse. And I just remember being sat there and it looked completely different in the front to being sat in the back. Um, it almost felt like you, you weren't sat in something, you were sort of out there in, in open space flying around. Really, really amazing feeling. And, uh, and the instructor I was with, a guy called Jamie Harms, uh, another Navy instructor, and he just, he just really sort of enthused me into flying this jet and we had a great time. I just loved that first flight. I thought the, the back cockpit and the front were kind of mirrored. Uh, I thought they were exactly the They same. are, but it's this sort of seating position. Of course, you haven't got anything in front of you apart from the, the arch of the canopy frame when you sat in the front. So there's no other head in front of you. There's not a load of other sort of structures. So it was just, yeah, all of a sudden felt like I was in a much more spacious environment. Um, it felt totally different to being sat in the back. Yeah, let's talk a bit about the cockpit because one thing I have always noticed is that weird throttle. It's like a stick rather than, you know. Yeah. Well, can you talk us through that? Uh, the throttle, yeah, I mean, it, I guess it does feel a bit different, especially you come from flying light aircraft and things like the Takano, but um, and the cockpit is a pretty basic cockpit. I mean, most people think when you're flying in any type of fast jet, even going back 20 years when I was flying this thing, that um, it was a you know, super advanced uh, cockpit. But in reality, pretty basic. You'd be seeing instruments that are very similar to what you see in a Cessna 152, but with a few additions like hydraulic pressure type things, uh, central warning panel for things when they go wrong, etc. But a pretty basic cockpit, really. Can you talk us through the stages of uh, your training on the Hawk, like how that progressed? Yeah, absolutely. So having left uh, RF Linton on News, you moved to RF Valley and it, split, it was split into two stages then. Different squadrons now, but at that stage it was 208 Squadron, which was the Advanced Flying Training Squadron, and 19 Fighter Squadron, which was the Tactical Weapons Unit. So essentially they teach you to fly the aircraft first on 208 Squadron, and then on 19 Fighter Squadron they teach you how to fight the aircraft. Um, so the initial training was all about handling, navigating at low level, of course at much greater speeds now, 420 knots, 7.5 miles a minute. Um, and um, uh, things like low, low level, uh, IMC at low level, um, handling aerobatics, advanced aerobatics, night flying, etc. Um, and then from that stage, yeah, you move to the TAC, TAC weapons unit, which is a, a totally different ball game. Uh, and it's really at that stage where you start to feel like you are a fighter pilot because you're starting to move into fighting the aircraft, air combat maneuvering, firing the, uh, the Aiden cannon, which incidentally I was rubbish at. So I don't think I think <laughs> I might have hit one one bullet out of a hundred on target, um, and dropping bombs, um, practice bombs on the range. Um, so I really, really enjoyed my training on the hall, but a, really a lot of hard work, and of course. As a, as a Navy fast jet pilot, with there only at that stage being one aircraft to go to, which was the Harrier, um, it, the pressure was on. If you didn't perform to the highest standards, above minimum course standard, you were not going single seat to, to, the, to the front line or to the OCU. So the pressure was always on, So, but, but an enjoyable time nonetheless. So what did you find uh, the biggest struggle or the hardest? Was it formation flying or uh, something like that? Yeah, so for me, um, well actually going back to, to shooting the cannon on the range, I, for some reason I just could not do that. Uh, it's a pretty dynamic environment. Everything happens really, really quickly. Bombing absolutely fine out. In fact, some of my better flights were doing bombing. Um, but firing a gun I found really, really challenging. But really it was just the tempo of it. And one of the things that I wasn't very good at back in the day, and I think a lot of pilots might admit to this to a greater or lesser extent was, was taking critique from the instructors because the standards were so high and the, the stakes were high if I didn't get it I was likely to be chopped and that would be at the end of my time uh, to go and fly the Harrier so yeah just, just the pressure really of constantly having to achieve and having to do better than the average to, to go single seat. So yeah because if you, were, you knew you were going to go to the Sea Harrier why would you do a 
uh, practice uh, bombing, like if it's an air-to-air -air platform? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, well, the Sea Harrier is actually multi-role. So they pr predominantly, its role was air-to-air, -air, um, air defense. It could also do reconnaissance and, and bombing, and pretty accurate bombing, um, actually, using the radar on the Sea Harrier. But we'll, we'll talk a bit more when we're still in front of the Sea Harrier about that, Mike. Do you ever conduct DACT in the Hawk? No, no, the Hawk um, for air combat training was Hawk on Hawk. I don't know if they do now. They might, they might do some of that now with the Hawk TT, but um, no, in our day, it was, it was only Hawk versus Hawk. What were the strengths and weaknesses of the Hawk? Um, it was a really nice aeroplane to fly. Its handling characteristics were um, delightful, to be honest with you, with, with one exception. If you're talking about a weakness in the circuit, if you um, weren't on speed going around the finals turn, it's very easy to, to stall the aircraft. In fact, one of the other guys um, on a similar course to me at Valley did just that, stalled and ejected at RAF Mona. Um, I remember actually sort of getting a bit of buffet on finals and just unloading and carrying on and then getting a uh, proper telling off by my instructor for not going around. Um, but it was a really nice aircraft to handle, really, really simple to fly. So as a, an introduction to fast jet flying, I think the Hawk is probably the most successful um, sort of light fast jet that there's ever been in my mind. Where would you conduct your flying training? Would there be specific routes or was it just anywhere you wanted? <laughs> That's a good question. Not anywhere we wanted, sadly. In fact, I did get told off for going to go and fly with my mum and dad's house once. So <laughs> even though I'd planned it as a proper low-level sortie. Um, but, and we're obviously based at RAF Valley um, with a sort of um, remote landing and circuit training area, RAF Mona. But the flying would take you all over the, the, the UK. Um, clearly, Wales really lends itself to low-level training, fast jet training and ACT um, uh, over, over, the, over the sea, away from sort of more busy airspace as you'd find when you head towards London. Um, but yeah, I mean, occasionally we go on landaways, but predominantly we're based out of RAF Valley and back into RAF Valley. So what was life like at Valley? Because I heard, yeah, as you say, it's very remote. Was, yeah. uh, was it a, a good place to live and train? I, I had a great time at Valley. You know, it, it isn't uh, like a mecca for going out and having nights out and all that sort of stuff. But um, I had a great time. I was into windsurfing, still am. So, you know, Ross and I go on Angle C. It was great to go windsurfing. Um, I remember some of my fondest memories sat uh, Friday evening watching all the jets coming back into the circuit and I'm sat down with my mates having a beer um, and then we'd, we'd all head off en masse at the weekend to Manchester or Chester as young lads for, and, and lasses for a, for, a, uh, for a weekend away but I really enjoyed my time on Valley. Yeah it was remote but actually if you're going to be training anywhere it was a fantastic place to train. Andrew, was there much banter between you and the RAF guys when you were on that family? <laughs> it's never banter, Mike, when we're bantering the Air Force. <laughs> okay, of course it was, yeah, loads of banter, but that's one of the great things about the military. Uh, I think it, um, for whatever reason, survives on banter. Banter is part of the culture, and uh, even to this day, there's always banter between the different services. Um, but it's something that I really loved about my time in the military, and I love now, even with my ex-mill friends, um, there's still banter to this day. Was there many egos when you were going through, you know, that kind of stereotypical fighter pilot kind of mindset? Yeah, yeah, I mean, occasionally it would, it would show its head. I mean, even with me, I suppose, you know, occasionally you'd, you'd find that sort of stuff, but generally not. It's not, you know, it's not Top Gun. You haven't got a load of people walking around punching, uh, punching their kit lockers and all that sort of stuff. Um, but no volleyball. No volleyball, no, so not, not, not me. I haven't got a six pack, so I can't be seen with my top off playing volleyball. <laughs> but um, no, it was, uh, it was generally people are pretty down to earth, is my experience of, of fast jet pilots. Andrew, what are your thoughts on the T2? Uh, I think, you know, generally speaking, when I went from the T1 to the Sea Harrier, well, the Sea Harrier wasn't a latest gen fighter, but it was a massive step up in capability and complexity compared to the Hawk. Not just with a head-up display, but radar systems, multifunction displays, much more complex aeroplane to fly. And although, you know, I became very proficient at flying the Hawk, navigating it at low level with a map and stopwatch, you know, within five seconds on the target, um, that, that step from, from moving from a Hawk to the Sea Harrier was massive. Now with the Hawk T2, moving map, head-up display, much more akin to the frontline jets that the guys and girls are going to go and fly, a Typhoon, F-35, etc. So I think it's, um, it's a great improvement to, to bring that capability to training, which aligns people more to what they're going to go and do on the front line. Andrew, how long did you spend on the Hawk and did you enjoy your time on it? Um, thinking back, it was probably about 18 months. Uh, absolutely loved my time on it, apart from that pressure we spoke about of always performing to, you know, above course standard. Um, it was, um, yeah, it was a really, really enjoyable time. Uh, some of the best days of my life, Mike, to be honest with you, flying that jet. How many hours did you get on the jet? A couple of hundred. 
something like that. But they're all hard-earned hours, and you know, now as, a, as an airline pilot, you sat there in a cruise doing 20 hours flying on a, on a one trip. But of course, when you're a fast jet pilot, or any military pilot, all that flying is really high-tempo stuff. So to build that level of experience in you know, a, a other aviation fields would take many, many more years and many more hours. So a couple hundred hours, but really intense, really high-level stuff.